Hi, welcome to our midweek Bible study. It is November 23rd, 2022. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 2. And as we uh, go to prayer, I just want to thank, I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving um, for tomorrow. I pray everybody has a great day with your families and just to be thankful to Christ, you know, and, and, and for the basics. Um, there may be difficult times that you're facing. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that, that, that if, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then your soul is sealed to the day of redemption. We have a great lesson on that coming up on Sunday, uh, that we have this inheritance in, in heaven reserved for us, and we are grateful for that. So we, we have so much to be thankful for when it comes to our spiritual walk not just the provisions god has if you're having a meal with your family um, every bit of that meal is supplied by god himself and he certainly is uh, worthy of our praise and worthy of our our thankfulness um, part of the issues in in romans one uh, is unthankfulness neither were they thankful the bible says and, and they suppressed the truth and they turned away from god and if you read romans one very carefully, it, it kind of describes the step by step of what's been happening throughout our nation. So we are grateful uh, for everything God does for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray and thank you, Lord, for salvation. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to die for us. So we thank you, Lord, for your provisions as, as meals are shared throughout the week. And we thank you, Lord, for your word as we study it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, this is a good chapter. Second Chronicles chapter 2. And we've really been um, getting a lot out of um, these studies in Chronicles. <clears throat> so today, um, Solomon is going to be gathering um, the workers for the building of the temple. He's ready to go. Uh, God has blessed him. Uh, we saw all the unbelievable material things that God gave him last week. And, uh, as a result of God asking Solomon, what did he need? And he said, I need wisdom and understanding. And God not only gave him wisdom and understanding, but gave him quite a overflow of material blessings. And so verse one says, Solomon was determined to build the temple for the name of the Lord in a royal house for himself. So there were two things that he was building. One was the temple for the Lord and another was a house for, the, for himself. Uh, all that was, was fine, <clears throat> directed by God. And in verse um, two it says, Solomon selected 70,000 men to bear burdens. 80,000 to quarry stone in the mountains and 3,600 to oversee them. Now, we're, well, I want you to remember those 70,000. We're going to get to more of them later. But I want you to look at verse 2 and just um, look at the phrase to bear burdens. And um, the Bible is, is all through uh, has this teaching of bearing each other's burdens and we saw it all the way back in Deuteronomy, and <clears throat> as things grow and, and get larger, there's a need for more help, more work, more workers. In Deuteronomy 1, verse 12, um, the work has become a little overbearing for Moses, and he, and he says, how can I bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes. I'll make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, the thing which you have told us to do is good. And so this is kind of similar to Acts chapter six, when the uh, widows were being neglected and they came to the apostles and the apostles said, you know, you need to choose seven good men that can, can handle this uh, serving at the tables because we as apostles must give ourselves to a prayer and to study the word. And so um, as things grow, um, we need more burden bearers, if you want to put it, um, 
Galatians 6, 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If you think you're better than everybody, you can't kind of pull your weight. You're deceiving yourselves. Uh, verse 4 of Galatians 6, but each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. And so we have a specific burdens to bear. And in this particular building of this temple, there was, there's a lot of different things to do. They would need iron workers, woodworkers, carvers, stone cutters, all kinds of different things. Just like a church needs people to work with the nursery and people to work with the elderly and people to work with the finances and people to work with um, insurance and contracts and people to preach and people to, to do all kinds of things. And so um, that's one of my um, favorite things. This is the Nineveh ministry kind of headed up by, by GM is, is there's some burden bearers there and everybody kind of has a place where they, they fit in on that Saturday and, and it, it gets done. It's pretty good. It's, it's uh, kind of fun to be around. Um, so what is your task? And, and that is um, kind of the ultimate, but we also see the, the gospel in these verses. Uh, the Bible says in second Corinthians five 21, that, that he who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This idea that we cannot carry this load of sin, it's too heavy, it's too burdenful. The wages of sin is death. This is really what the Bible is all about. It's what the universe is all about. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden uh, uh, fell under the weight of sin. And God promised that there would be a, a redeemer that would come, a seed. And that seed was Jesus. We had closer to Christmas to celebrate this birth of Jesus Christ. Born of a woman. We'll talk more about this on Sunday. And, and what a blessed uh, gift it was for God to send his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him will not perish. You see, the truth of this matter is, is every human being is weighed and burdened down by sin. Jesus came and, and carried that burden, carried his cross. The Bible says that those who follow him must take up your cross and follow him. And it's, it's this idea of now we want to carry the 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 burden of, of the gospel, so to speak. And it's not burdensome, but it is uh, his work. There's things to do. There's places to fill. But Jesus took our sin upon him, died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day. That's the gospel. That's the whole story. Mankind was created. We're all sinners. Nobody's perfect. Because of that, we are destined to be separated from God forever because he is holy and we are not. And yet God was so gracious. This is what we're thankful for, that he bore those burdens of our sins on the cross and defeated death. And so if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, oh, what a time to do so. What a, what a blessed Thanksgiving you would have to be thankful for God for saving your soul. And um, it's a simple belief, the truth. Am I a sinner? The answer is yes. Did Jesus die on the cross? Was he buried in a tomb? And did he rise again? Was there an empty tomb? There was. Many, many, many witnesses saw him. It's a historical fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So therefore, I trust in that. I trust that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I trust that he is on the right hand of God. I've confessed with a mouth. I believe that he's Lord, and I know that he's risen from the dead. And if I'm not saved, Romans 10, 9 is a lie, and it's impossible for God to lie. <clears throat> so I, I lay that out there today. The greatest uh, burden bearer in the history of the world is Jesus Christ himself. So on the practical part of this chapter, Solomon sent to Hiram, the king of Tyre. Uh, we're going to talk much more about the king of Tyre later, but I want you to get to um, what he says in, in verse three. As you have dealt with David, my father, 
and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in. So deal with me. So he turns himself to uh, this king of Tyre. This king of Tyre has been a connected to David all the way back um, in Samuel. And we're going to see that a little bit later. But what I want you to see is, is that, that this king of Tyre has already dealt favorably with, with Israel. And we're going to see later that, that Ty, this king of Tyre, Hiram is his name, he really sees something different in the Israelites. Uh, John 13, 34 says this, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We are a peculiar people, the Bible says. We are different from the world and we want to be uh, and we need to be. The world needs to see and, and the main difference that they would see in us is, is love, unconditional love for one another. And uh, Satan's uh, done a pretty good job of, of kind of uh, uh, coding that love with denominations, different. I, I, the internet is filled with nothing but <clears throat> uh, arguments and debates from Christians. And, and if I'm of the world, not a Christian, and I'm looking and searching for sermons and messages. Every message is why I'm right and everybody else is wrong. The message should be that Christ is right. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes in the Father except through me. Um, if you listen regularly to these Bible studies on, on our Wednesday midweek, they're, they're pretty, they're deeper than, than a Sunday morning. But but if they're being recorded, the gospel is going to be shared. And because you never know who, who may be listening. Maybe you need to hear the gospel. Maybe you've not ever heard the good news that Jesus bore the burdens for your sins and was buried and rose again without him. And you see, boy, that's repetitious. But that's what every message should be. Not, well, this is why you should come to our church because this church over there believes this and that's rotten, dirty, rotten church over there and that church over here and we don't believe. Just preach. Why can't we just preach the word in love? Um, and so the Israelites had a good reputation with this king of Tyre. He saw something. We're going to see even more of that described later. But I want to get to verses four through six. They're the best verses in this chapter. They're fabulous. And I, they're, they're, there's a bunch of stuff in these next three verses. And if you're a born again believer and you love God and you're thankful for him, uh, these verses are really good. And so let's look at verse four. Um, Behold, I am building a temple For the name of the Lord my God and to dedicate it to him. Uh, that's important. We're going we're gonna to really um, filter through these next three verses because they're really good. It, what he says is so humble. Um, he understands his task. His task is very clear to him. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, for 30 years or so, my task has been pretty clear to me as a school teacher and a pastor and preaching in the word and teaching in the Bible. Although last year, my task has been uh, complicated. And so uh, to have a clear task is, is a blessing, I tell you. And he had a clear task. And he says, look, at, I am building a temple for the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him, not to dedicate it to me. I'm not building a, you know, uh, a building that's going to say it's the Solomon temple of God is not, even though we call it Solomon's temple, uh, he wouldn't do that. It's not, sometimes we build things in the world to ourselves. And he says, look at why to burn before him sweet incense for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings, morning and evening on the Sabbaths of the new moons and on the set feasts of the Lord our God. And this is going to be a temple of worship a temple of sacrifice, a temple where our sins will be forgiven, a temple for our God. This is an ordinance forever to 
Israel. It's, it's an ordinance. It's a, it's a commandment. It's a directive from God. Um, verse 5 says, the temple which I build will be great. Now, that phrase right there sounds a little bit um, like he's prideful. I'm going to build it. But he's just, if you read the rest of it, you get the whole picture. I build will be great. The temple which I will build will be great. Our God is greater than all gods. Now, that is such a bold statement. He's writing this king who's not Jewish and maybe worshiping other gods. We don't know. But the boldness to say our God is greater than all gods. This is what really struck me is, is we can uh, have a tendency to hesitate. Um, Pastor Rick Reagan and Planata preached a message on Sunday from um, Luke 12. We're going to look at some verses from there. But it was on the, the fear that causes hypocrisy, the fear that causes us to hesitate with our witness at times, because we're more concerned about what men might say about us than, than praising God's name um, in front of them. So this idea here is that he is so bold. You know, this God, he is greater than all gods. Well, that, that you would think if you're trying to get some wood and things to build this temple, you would candy coat it a little bit, compromise a little bit. And he doesn't. I just really like that a lot. Um, but who was able to build him a temple? Since heaven and the heavens of heavens cannot contain him. Boy, there's a lot of that heaven. There's a lot of heavens. There's, there's the, the heaven that is the atmosphere. And there's the heaven where God is. And there's the heavens, which is space. And, and he is just simply saying that our temple, unlike the, the temples they build for some of the false gods, Temple of Diana, that that's where you go. That's where she is. And he said, look at this. This building is not going to be where God is because he's everywhere. He is everywhere. He's in you. If you're a believer, he is in you. If you're not a believer, he's all around you. The heavens declare his glory, Romans 1. And so if you uh, want Christ to live in you, then then ask him, trust in him, say, God, I, 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 is this gray hair man right? Am I truly a sinner? Do, are you really the, the God who died for me and rose again? Uh, ask him, reach out to him, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Um, but he says, look, I'm, I have this task and this is why verse five is not really prideful. I'm going to build a temple uh, which will be great for our God who's greater than all gods. But uh, nobody can really build a temple for God because not even the heavens of the heavens and the heavens can hold them because our God is everywhere. I just really like that. No building can contain him. So be careful. The building is, is a building, but the body is the church. It's the, it's the people. Um, who am I then that I should build him a temple except to burn sacrifice to him? So there's the humility. And, and there's so much in this verse. Uh, it, it, it's, it's different than any building or structure uh, for ourselves. He's building something to honor God while remaining humble. Who, humble. Who am I then that I should build him a temple? The only reason I'm building it is so we have a place to come and, and bear our burn uh, sacrifice before him. I need a place where I can come to God and humbly confess my sins to him. That's what this temple's for. It's not for my glory. And we tend to build things that we kind of say are for God, but we take all the credit for it. And we even put our names on it. And uh, um, men who name ministries after themselves and things like that, we're kind of building a a kingdom for ourselves and it's not to be that way and so i really like this, this these verses there's so much in it um i'm building a temple for the name of my lord for the continual worship because god has ordained me to do so and this building will be great because our god is greater than any other gods because there are no other gods 
And this building is not something that can contain him because the heavens and the heavens cannot even contain him. And I'm not even qualified to build this building, but I build it because I need a place to bear my sins. Man, it's beautiful. His testimony is so clear. Luke 12, 4 says this about our testimony. It's really good. I mean, Pastor Rick Reagan preached on this on Sunday at Planada. He says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you to whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. He didn't fear Tyre. He didn't fear this king. He told him, my God is the God of God. There's no other gods. And my God, no temple can hold him. And my God deserves every sacrifice and every burnt incense and every praise. My God is the God. Now, can you foreign person provide what I need to build this temple for my God? And, and today, you know, that certainly wouldn't hold. If, if you, you know, go on to uh, uh, GoFundMe and say, I'm, I need funds to, to build a, a, a house where I can tell people without Jesus, they're going to hell and tell people that, that we need to get back to the morals of this land and I need to raise money to build this. Uh, most of the country wouldn't donate. In fact, you'd be probably brought vile uh, comments towards this fundraiser. But he was bold. Uh, Luke 12, verse 8 says, Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him before angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. God says, I don't want you to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16. And he, he, he says, look, at, don't fear those who can harm the body. That's nothing. Fear the one who takes the soul and can either bring it to heaven or cast it to hell. And he desires all to come to know him. And so uh, trust in him. And then if someone kills my body, I won't even feel it. I'll be gone, absent from the body, and I'll be present with the Lord. And I just love his boldness in these verses. Um, and that's really the key. Uh, two things so far. That, that are the key. One, if you're not a Christian, turn your life over to the one who bore your burdens on the cross. And two, if you are a Christian, be bold and, and, and build your life for him. Make it something to the God above all gods because there are no other gods. Well, he's now we're going to get to the kind of the practical part. We'll go a little quicker through these. Uh, verses 7 to uh, 10, he... Uh, of Second Chronicles, he expresses what he needs, and he needs a lot. He says, "Send me once, uh, send me at once a man skillful to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, purple and crimson, who has the skill to engrave with skillful men who are with me in Jerusalem, whom David my father provided." Most of the Israelites were kind of farmers or shepherds. The craftsmen were usually from other nations. So we needed some craftsmen. Verse 8, send me cedar and cypress and algum logs from Lebanon. For I know that your servants have skill to cut timber in Lebanon. And indeed, my servants will be your servants to prepare timber for me in the abundance of the temple, which I'm about to build, shall be great and wonderful. And indeed, I'll give to your servants the woodsmen who cut timber 20,000 cores of ground wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 baths of wine, 20,000 baths of oil. So this is going to be a business deal. He's not asking for the donation. It's a little different. I remember when Nehemiah asked the king, he needed it uh, given to him. He didn't have the money to buy it. Solomon does. A bath of oil, that's about... Uh, uh, six gallons is a bath and core is more. So he's, he's asking for a, a business deal. I'll give you all of this. I need timber and workers. Now, how is this king going to respond to it? And because and, he needs these things. But the Bible says in Matthew 6, 
Hey, the father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And he needs quite a bit, but God shall supply all of your needs. God is asking Solomon to build a temple. So he's going to give him all the things that he needs to build it and the skill to do it. Uh, and it's the same in your life. Whatever that task is that God is calling us to do, uh, whether it's in Nineveh, the shoe boxes, we've always seen around here God supplying the needs. We've got Christmas boxes coming up and uh, God's going to supply whatever we need for those things. And uh, to the point where we don't really worry about it because God has done it for years. So verse 11, Hiram, the king of Tyre, answered in writing, which he sent to Solomon. So now Hiram's going to answer him. Here's what I'm going to do. And, and Hiram's been around for a long time. Second uh, Samuel 5.10, David is finally on the throne. And, and uh, Saul is gone and everything is finally there. And, and David went on and became great. Second Samuel 5.10. And the Lord of God of hosts was with him. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, this is the first time we see him in scripture, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. Um, so the king of Tyre was impressed with David and saw that, that David's God was with him. We'll see that in a second. And because of that, um, when David became king, he just came and built them a house. Uh, after David got the house, David was, was then motivated to build this temple. <clears throat> and finally, it's going to happen. Um, so let's look at what Hiram writes to um, Solomon. He says, because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Isn't that interesting? Because the Lord loves his people. Now, there's, there's no scripture that we know for sure whether this king is a believer or not a believer. What we do know for sure is he sees something in Israel and something in their king, something that, that has impressed him. And he acknowledges that the Lord loves his people. So you, it, does he think the God of Israel is the Lord? Look what he says in verse 12. He also said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Again, he sees the God being specifically for Israel. Uh, who made heaven and earth. Well, that's a pretty good acknowledgement, isn't it? For he has given King David a wise son, endowed with prudence and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal house for himself. Um so his testimony there, if you would lean towards that, that if you know he says that he created the heavens and the earth, he acknowledges this God. And so that's in God's hand, but he certainly was. Um, you know, the Bible says that the the hand of the diligent will, will the Bible says that the, the kings are moved like the rivers of the water. And so this guy was in the right place at the right time. Um, and he calls him the creator of heaven and earth. You can't, you can't kind of get past that. Um, so what a perfect person to have at this right time. He has all the materials and the workers that Solomon's going to need, and they make a business deal. Look at verse 13. I sent you a skillful man endowed with understanding. Hiram, my master craftsman. So, uh, Hiram is called Hiram in other verses. Uh, and so this guy has the same name, but he's got an interesting background. He's the son of the woman of the daughters of Dan. And his father was a man of Tyre. So he's a half Jew and half Gentile. Um, so I wanted to stop just for a second and, and make a point on this. But there's another verse that says he was a tribe of Naphtali. And what theologians believe he was probably a uh, of the lineage of Naphtali, but lived in the area of Dan. Um, and he was a mixed race, a, a, a man of Tyre and a woman from Israel. Um, 
And we see this temple is being used with wood from Gentile nations, uh, built by both Gentile and Jewish builders and craftsmen. Um, uh, one of the main craftsmen was half Jew and half Gentile. And it just reminds me that, that God is, there's neither Jew nor Greek. We read this verse this last week. Uh, salvation and, and access to God is for everybody. And while the Jews took this temple and exclusively used it for Jewish worship, um, uh, the house itself was was uh, unified and, and spread out. It's kind of neat there for me. Um, so this guy had skill to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, stone and wood, purple and blue, fine linen and crimson, to make any engraving, to accomplish any plan which may be given him with your skillful men and the skillful men of my Lord David, your father. And so I got the perfect guy for you. He can do it all. He literally, you know, he's, he's the James Clinton, so to speak, um, of our of our city and he's going to come in and he's going to head this up and uh it was a little bit of a business deal look at verse 15 therefore the wheat the barley oil the wine which my lord has spoken of send him to his servants will cut the wood from the lebanon as much as you need bring it to you in rafts by the city of joppa and you will carry it to jerusalem so we're going to cut it so they had to work together they'll cut it but how to get it there was pretty extensive but Solomon numbered the aliens who were in the land of Israel after the consensus in which David, his father, had numbered them. And there were found to be 153,600. So these aliens were, were basically prisoners of war, so to speak. He made 70,000 of them bearers of burdens. So this was goes back. You see, there's a great lesson here. We're going to close with this. Christ, we are called to bear one another's burdens. Christ has bore our burdens on the cross. But if you reject him, then you will bear your own burdens. And the weight will be way too heavy. And it will be eternal. And it will be sad. He, these are men who rejected Christ. And the Bible says this, the hand of the diligent will rule, Proverbs 12, 24. But the lazy man will be put to forced labor. There's more burden on the lazy man. And if you reject Christ, the burdens will, will fall upon you. It's a, uh, it, it's a heavy weight to carry. Uh, so Jesus come, says, come to me, all you who are weary and labor, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And these bearers of the burdens, 80,000 stone cutters in the mountains and the 3,600 overseers to make the people work. So these were aliens. These were the ones who were put to forced labor, so to speak. Um, bearing each other's burdens is a great lesson here. Boldness in our witness for Christ is a great lesson here. God supplying all of our needs is a great lesson here. Um, Matthew 9, 35 says this, I'll close. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among people. But when he saw that the multitudes was moved with, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. The lost world is just scattered. We see that. All we like sheep have gone astray. So Matt, Matthew 9, 37, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. That's us. We need to bear the burdens and, and go into the world and preach the gospel. Uh, share with it, whether it's with our family and to be bold as he was, to not fear what man can do to me, to, to not uh, fear the ones who can hurt the body, but serve the one who controls the soul. That's what we need to do, to build a life for him um, uh, on this foundation that is Christ, to build a life of, of gold and silver and, and, and precious stone and not of wood, hay and stubble, but a life that matters. 
and, and I trust that you will. And uh, so much in this chapter, I, I pray it was a blessing to you as it was to me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Help us, Father, uh, to thank the one who bore our burdens and to in turn take up our cross and follow him to become those laborers that are needed to stand in the gap between those who need Christ and the Christ that we know. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Thanksgiving. And I trust you will. And we'll talk to you soon.